I do not see the countries and peoples of Africa as a world apart. I see Africa as a fundamental part of our interconnected world. Kwame Nkrumah returned from studying in the United States and England and spearheading the 1945 Pan-African Congress, becoming a symbol of African independence. I speak to his daughter, Samia Nkrumah, a member of the Ghanaian Parliament at the Nkrumah Memorial Park in Accra, Ghana. Ghana, 1957. Everybody marks that independence as the beginning of the movement for independence on the African continent. Why? Okay, to start with, Ghana was the first sub-Saharan African country to gain independence. But what is significant is the moment Ghana won independence, it started helping other liberation movements, actively helping them. And there are many, many stories to be told. Uh, from helping Algeria, the liberation movement in Algeria, to Guinea, to Southern Africa, everywhere. And that is why three years later, 1960, which is the year we call the Africa year, the year of Africa, 17 countries gained independence. It was not a coincidence. It was not a coincidence. Ghana was actively helping liberation movements in various ways. In fact, in '58, there was the All African Peoples uh, Conference here in Accra, where many would-be leaders of African states were present, attended. So there was a, 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 a vision to help other countries become politically independent, and that confirms Kwame Nkrumah's statement on the eve of independence. Our independence is meaningless unless it is linked up with the total liberation of the African continent. Ghana, through Kwame Nkrumah, had put forward a list of proposals to help us unite as a continent. Common currency, common markets, common citizenship in borderless continents, um, central bank, um, common foreign policy and defense uh, strategy. In short, a list of proposals and projects that Europe went to implement years after. So we know that we are pioneers in unity. New leaders with democratic dreams for their new nations gave Africa and the world hope. At such a moment in history, everything seemed possible. And nothing captured this more than the movement in Ghana, the beacon of African independence. I asked His Excellency John Kufour to place Nkrumah's relevance in historical context. How relevant um, do you think the idea of, you know, Nkrumah's old idea of African unity? Very relevant. It was, it's, it's not as yet even fully realized or fulfilled. And Kuma was perhaps talking more politics than economics then. Now the world talks markets. The bigger your market, the more attractive you are. I believe this is the power of China and India and uh, the European Union. Everybody is seeing the sense of combining to create a sizable market. Uh, uh, in the globalization process. So Nkrumah's statement, that statement, I believe, 
was quite prophetic. Whether he appreciated the economics of it or not, uh, it was prophetic. And his place in history, I believe, is uh, above question. He, he led in the Pan-African struggle, saw so Africa as one uh, continent of the same people uh, who should come together to command the respect of the rest of the world. Very good. Like Ghana, other African nations provided critical assistance in the Pan-African struggle for independence, as His Excellency Kenneth Kaunda explains to me. We had a duty to assist our colleagues in Angola, west of us, Mozambique, east of us, under the Portuguese. Zimbabwe, southern Odisha, in those days, because we were northern Odisha, they were under the British settlers. South Africa, Boers and the British mixed to form apartheid. Namibia, the same thing. Namibia had been under the Germans before that. Mahatma Gandhi's student, Pandit Nehru, the first prime minister of India, wrote like this in one of his books. When you are fighting against British colonialism, you can afford to fight in a non-violent way. Non-violent way meant defying unjust laws, being sent to prison for that, coming out, continuing until you won. We followed that path. But when you're fighting other colonial powers, you can't afford to do that. You've got to fight using the gun. So our, I could see that he was very right. For our colleagues in the other countries around us, we had to help fight in a violent way, using the gun, using the weapon. How could we help them? At the time before our independence, we had to allow our colleagues to pass through Northern Asia, to come to Tanzania, here, under Mwalimu Julius Nyerere, who found places for them in the country where they could go and train how to go and fight for their independence. In the East, revolutionaries like Daydan Kimathi fought using guerrilla warfare against the British. Daydan Kimathi was the leader of the Mau Mau Freedom Fighters. The Mau Mau Freedom Fighters brought British colonialism in East Africa to its knees. It shook the very foundation of the meaning of British colonialism in East Africa. The primary school teacher, Daydan Kimathi, from a small village in Kenya, became a leader of the independence movement, along with figures like Jomo Kenyatta. Jomo Kenyatta attended the 1945 Pan-African Congress with Kwame Nkrumah and W.E.B. Du Bois. He returned to Kenya from working and studying in London in 1946 as a leader of the independence movement. I returned to Mrs. Kimathi for an inside view about the relationship between these two freedom fighters. Moya ine todwa oria Kimathi kaga na oria Kenyatta ekaga mago mana monire kiri amareda ni vuluri witu ugie na wiyathi kwogo makiuga ni kaba Kimathi akiuga ni kaba gukua kuri gutura mudu ari adamu Aturagiria mudu marutari wa Ngai na ithuo tuhoyaga Ngai uri uri muyo uri aturagiria mbura na gatuhe thayo wa guikara twina muyo riu niguo monire ni kwagireire tugie na wiyathi witwika ukihitukio ona andu makua mathire gutigare kahi na kairitu kama Africa ni gagachokia beu kwogo matikama ke ni kuragwo Mrs. Kimathi explains that Daydan Kimathi taught that Africans were equal to whites and that they had the same color blood and worshipped the same God. Every African nation with a large European population had to fight bloody wars to end colonial domination. Sometimes the struggle for equality got violent, 
Mrs. Kimathi was a member of the Land Freedom Army, or Mau Mau. Can you talk to me about what the Land Freedom Army was? She explains her life as a freedom fighter and the dream of independence in Kenya. She outlines how she and her colleagues came to the conclusion that arms were necessary in order to become free and independent. Kimathi and Kenyatta fought for independence, which eventually led to both being detained by the colonial powers. Who captured Kimathi? It cost Kimathi his life. It cost Jomo Kenyatta nine years in prison. But the Mau Mau freedom fighters go down as one of the pillars in the independence movement of East Africa. As Kimathi would say, it is better to die on our feet than live on our knees in fear of colonial rule. Ultimately, Kenya gained its independence in 1963. I sit down with His Excellency Pedro Perez of the Republic of Cape Verde, who fought for the independence of Cape Verde and Guinea-Bissau to understand the significance of this dimension of the fight. But the question is the following. The attitude of the population of origin European na atitude, se estão pela libertação da maioria ou se não estão. Se estão contra a libertação da maioria, portanto, estão do lado do colonizador. Se estão a favor do, da libertação da, da, da maioria, estarão do lado do colonizado, daquele que busca a sua liberdade. Portanto, não é uma condenação, mas é uma atitude, um posicionamento. Mas há outros factos que a se ter em conta. Portanto, é o estabelecimento dessas populações. Em que condições se estabeleceram e que privilégios tiveram, que violência cometeram contra as populações africanas, negras ou, ou outras, esse estabelecimento foi um estabelecimento violento ou foi pacífico? Tudo, de, tudo depende da, das circunstâncias, das circunstâncias históricas. Mas a luta à libertação nacional não é dirigida a, contra ninguém pela sua cor, mas sim pelo seu posicionamento, pela sua atitude, pela forma como, enfim, Está a favor ou contra? Kwame Nkrumah, forever the Pan-Africanist, had a dream that Ghana's independence would spark a movement that would lead to independence of the entire continent, and that this independence would lead to Africans coming together in one United States of Africa.
By 1960, the African call for independence was clear. Even France and Britain came to recognize that the old game of colonialism was over. February 1960, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, Harold Macmillan, comes here to South Africa to speak to the Parliament in Cape Town. He had received a lot of criticism for uh, his visit to South Africa. I mean, people thought, you're visiting South Africa and they have an apartheid government. And in 1960, this was even a bad thing to do, especially for a high-ranking member of the British government. But he was on his way. And his critics had to take a seat when they heard the content of his speech. Let's listen to what he has to say. Fifteen years ago, this movement spread through Asia. Many countries there of different races and civilizations pressed their claim to an independent national life. Today, the same thing is happening in Africa. Okay, so now he's dating the movement back 15 years, which places it at the end of World War II in 1945. And he's saying this wind of change blew all over Asia as people stood up and claimed their national citizenship and claimed an end to colonialism and the birth of independence. Here, this movement was born and it is spreading all over Africa so that by 1960, it is undeniable that independence is coming to the African continent. Check this out. Most striking of all the impressions that I have formed since I left London a month ago is of the strength of this African national consciousness. In different places, it takes different forms. But it is happening everywhere. The wind of change is blowing through this continent. Whether we like it or not, this growth of national consciousness is a political fact. We must all accept it as a fact. Wow. African independence is a fact. The wind of change that is blowing across the African continent is that wind of independence. His Excellency Ali Hassan Mwenyi describes to me the impact of Macmillan's speech on the movement at his home in Dar es Salaam. That was long after, very long after we had started. Though it, that was not a new thing at all. It was pronouncing ideas that, that we had already. And we felt very, very happy indeed because we thought it was only the South Africans, the Boers, who needed that speech. The rest of us were ready for it. We, in fact, we were working towards achieving what he was telling the Boers, the Boers in South Africa. His Excellency Rupia Banda adds, I'm almost certain that it had the same impact on me as it had on you and on most of us, black people all over Africa, all Africans. Because don't forget that Mr. Macmillan was the Prime Minister from the Conservative Party of the United Kingdom. And one would have expected him uh, to support colonialism, continued colonialism. But it was significant that he said what he said. And the impact was so overwhelming right across Africa. I remember very clearly I was a young man then. And it was such, such uh, wonderful to hear that even they think it's possible. So why should I be doubting myself? So we intensified our, our fight for liberation. Not everyone agreed with the direction of the winds of independence. I am visiting the last South African president of the apartheid regime, F.W. de Klerk, at his offices in Cape Town. In that speech, he argued that the world and Africa were changing and that these changes really required 
colonial governments and the apartheid government to change their national politics. How did this speech affect your politics? Initially, it made everybody, of course, think because it was a far-reaching speech. But generally speaking, the party as it then was, I was just out of university, I wasn't part of it. Uh, in the end, reacted negatively because it showed, according to their interpretation, a lack of understanding for my people, the Afrikaner people. This tendency to to deal with the Afrikaner at that stage in the same breath as you were dealing with colonialism was rejected by the party. Because the Afrikaners fought the first modern anti-colonial freedom war on the soil of South Africa against Great Britain. In 1834 there was a great trek. People weren't happy with British rule here in the Cape province and moved into the hinterland of South Africa, established finally two republics. Republics, full democratic republics, governed themselves from the 1840, 1850s, right until the end of that century. And then gold and diamonds were discovered. And then suddenly the British started to get very interested and in the end, the Anglo-Boer War took place. It took them three years to subjugate the Afrikaner of those two republics. It is against that background that there was a feeling that the concept of self-determination for the Afrikaner people should be given space in international thinking. And it was on that foundation of saying we governed ourselves in the past, we had good relations with other black African nations in South Africa who governed themselves, the Zulus, the Kozas, the Sutus, the Tswanas, and we want a country and a land in which we govern ourselves. That was the moral justification for apartheid, which then became separate development. It was the same concept that the whole world now supports for Israel and Palestine. Divide the land on the basis of ethnicity, on the basis of having nation states for each identifiable nation. But it failed in South Africa. The end of World War II meant decolonization for most of Africa the destruction of European economies and U.S. opposition to colonial monopolies meant classical colonialism was about to die. However, here in South Africa, 1948 marked the birth of apartheid. I sit down with His Excellency Benjamin M. Kappa of Tanzania, who connects the rise of apartheid and Nkrumah's call for African unity. As a college student, I was involved in what we called the anti-apartheid movement. And we always found great inspiration and took great pride in the existence of the frontline states. Tanzania was one of the principal frontline states. Can you discuss what this meant for Tanzania and why the country was involved in it? The liberation of the whole continent was perceived as the number one agenda by all colonies on this continent, be they under the French, the Portuguese, and the Spaniards, or the British. And um, following Ghana's independence, Kwame Nkrumah made the call, or rather the exhortation to his people, that the independence of Ghana was meaningless unless it was linked with the independence of the whole African people and their, and their African countries. That message, that lesson, was inculcated in many of the, of the schools, in many uh, of, of, of uh, the countries that were under colonial uh, domination. We, of course, were under a trusteeship of the United Nations, but the trusteeship was a, 
was given to the British government. And so we had a double reason why we had such an, an interest in the liberation of Southern Africa. Because as, as a UN trust territory, we felt that it was also our duty to help these countries. And that is how the people of Tanzania at independence, but especially more vigorously after independence, took on this cause of helping the countries of Southern Africa, still under colonialism and apartheid, uh, become independent, fight for their independence. Um, Mali Munyerere echoed uh, Kwame Nkrumah, and uh, as one country became, in, one country after another became independent, they, they established the practice of getting together in order to mobilize their efforts in their common adv advance of the liberation struggle in Southern Africa. That is how the frontline states not concept was, was born. And it, 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 uh, the, the numbers of the frontline states uh, increased as one country after another became independent. As Zambia became independent, as Mozambique became independent, as Botswana became independent, and so on. And Zimbabwe became independent. So that is how it went. But basically, we were deeply moved uh, driven by the urge to see the whole of Africa free and independent.